Welcome to Cobb, Conversations on the Business of Brands with Sudeep Chabla and Sharvan Raghavan. Okay, so Sharan, uh, in one of our previous episodes, we spoke about various stages of FMCG business. Right. And you used all your experience that, that you've garnered by consulting many of these companies that want to grow to a certain stage. Uh, and you spoke to us about these stages, six stages, right? Right. Let's first recount those stages so that uh, our listeners are able to remember what we spoke about. Okay. Because today's episode is specifically about those stages and mm-hmm. a question that I asked during uh, the question that I asked you during that episode. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, so I will not let you escape without necessarily answering that question that I asked on the behalf of the listeners there. <laughs> sure. So we said that there is this startup stage hmm. where uh, obviously everything is hunky-dory, everything is pure. You've just conceived the idea and you've got your product market fit. Right. And then there was this stage which looked quite arduous and you termed it the long chew. Yeah, right. Yeah, where you have to, you know, put in a lot of things into place so that you are able to leverage them later. Right. Yeah. And then you, you know, get to what we called as acceleration stage, which is where you start seeing the pull for your brand. And your investments start bearing fruits and hopefully your ROIs become significantly better. Your margins become better. Right. Uh, you start becoming what we call as brand building. Brand. Right. Yeah. So now you have a product brand. Uh, from there, the fourth stage possibly was about house of brands. You start thinking about a number of brands under a bigger umbrella. Number of brands addressing different uh, opportunities that you really want to pursue uh, within right. the same consumer set or a different consumer set. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, we really spoke about going really big. So the fifth was about a MNC where you have, you know, uh, brands across geographies. Uh, right. Your brands are known and there's sufficient consumer pull uh, across geographies. Hmm. And the last stage is about being a Fortune 500 company where each one of your brand becomes uh, an icon in itself and consumers across the world recognize it for what it stands for and hopefully there is homogeneity in the uh, you know brand recognition all across there was a specific question that i asked towards the end of the episode which you said that we will answer uh, we have not covered it in this episode and we will possibly take another episode to answer it do you remember the question yes i do actually because uh, you asked me if there is a way to cut short these stages and if a business can jump these stages mm. and especially the long chew period mm. if what must a business do to jump it correct correct right. and the and the specific reference that i was coming from sharan was mm. uh, from the whole perspective of having a d2c brand right yeah, a number of our listeners possibly are either thinking about that or they are working in one. And so therefore, uh, how do these stages apply to a D2C business? Hmm. And do they have to go through this entire long chew and all the six stages or there is another journey for them? So that's where that's what my question was. Yes. Uh, and let's have it as the topic for today. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> why don't you start with your initial reaction to the question then we take it forward for our listeners okay initial reaction is that can these stages be cut short absolutely because they are not milestones defined by time they are more milestones defined by the business the level of business execution that is there in the system so depending on how fast you execute you can cut short the time you spend in each of these stages Hmm. that said now can you skip some of these stages? Hmm. In my opinion, from what I've seen with a lot of my clients and the businesses I've worked in, you really cannot. Mm-hmm. There is, uh, I did see a few responses to the previous episode where people said the D2C businesses have skipped the long chew and gone into the acceleration phase. I don't completely agree, but what I see with that is that 
you can put one stage before the other, but you still have to go through every stage in this evolution. It may not be very clear, so let me explain that. But despite your summary, I'm going to quickly recap what of what these stages were. Right. Mm -hmm. So, in the startup stage, stages when you're doing the product market fit, you focused on getting your first set of consumers. You're obsessed about the product you're creating. You've created a brand identity. That doesn't mean you focused on brand building. Mm. You are usually pre-profits, and you can't really short this stage. You really have to. That's the starting of the business, and you're filled with a lot of adrenaline, you know, with hope and optimism, and a, and also a sense of nervousness when you start. So that is not something you're going to short. That's how everybody starts. Now the long chew is when you have push sales. You need to set up a GTM, and this is what the D two C brands seem to have bypassed. And mm. in the acceleration stage is when it is a brand driven pull business. when there's pull sales happening when the brand is pulling in the sales i'm not going into the other stages because this is the three that we will focus on today mm. now for the longest time the moat that most fmcg businesses had was the distribution infrastructure that they had that mm. they built over time and with e-commerce the d2c businesses shocked these smaller fmcg businesses by just jumping over the d2 the, the moat that these guys had mm. they said i can reach the customers very easily because of e-commerce and the digital infrastructure that exists mm. and that shocked the system it did mm. Mm. but is d2c as a channel viable for long term business i'm not sure because your e-com penetration in fmcg the contribution of e-commerce is about say 4 to 5% at best right now okay and it's expected to go up to 10% in the next 6 years mm. and i at the beginning of my career i was part of conversations where some industry experts predicted modern trade would be 50% of india's fmcg business by 2020 mm. so we know what modern trade contributes today mm. about 10 to 12% roughly yeah so i'm not denouncing e-commerce totally mm. the effect of e-commerce in the fmcg business will be limited for now so sharan when you speak about disruption of the moat in the times when traditional trade was the only way of reaching consumers hmm. the traditional companies had mastered the art of that reach right now e-commerce came and created that reach uh in a slightly more differential manner and mm. made it democratic both uh, e-commerce as well as modern trade mm. make made it democratic for brands to be able to reach that particular segment right the yeah. targeted segment the targeted segment now uh, i think what the uh, when you say numbers like 4 to 5% and 10 to 12% penetration of modern trade etc what we essentially mean is that uh, now india is not one india india is many indias right now in certain india let's call it india a yeah mm -hmm. or nccs a1 maybe mm. the right. reach of modern trade and e-commerce might be significantly high it might be 50 60% right and amongst those an e-commerce plus modern trade might be able to give good amount of competition to traditional trade and hence you know completely disrupting the moat etc etc but when you right. go to india b and india c that is where the traditional channel starts you know uh, experiencing its moat again absolutely yeah so therefore i think depending on which category uh, our listeners are referencing to hmm. what you said might become completely true or completely untrue yeah depending on the context okay yeah for example if you are selling a very high end consumable hmm yeah for example very high end functional whey protein hmm the entire tam would be on e-commerce uh, entire tam would be in metro cities hmm yeah largely and therefore in metro cities therefore i have great reach for e-commerce and modern trade so i can survive 
without traditional trade right from a reach perspective hmm. uh, but i like the second point that you were making sharan and i think you should build upon this a bit reach these channels might be able to give but you know when the brand starts becoming better the roi is significantly different in the case of traditional as well as mon exactly exactly yeah. and just elaborate uh, on that point a bit sharan the roi bit see the whole point of roi and the roas that's going on today mm-hmm. is that the system is engineered to make you spend more money for the same business Hmm. So I've met with so many clients who say, "When I started my business, my ROAS was so high, hmm. but now it has dropped." It is because the system is engineered in a way that the moment your business and your brand is selling well, Facebook and Google make money by telling your competitors that this is how you are making money, and to increase competition for the same space, hmm. and the entire e-com. system including amazon not just facebook and google including amazon is built in a way that you end up spending more money to get the same business over time now this is unless you have built a strong brand which can automatically draw the audience to your business which is the brand pull we spoke about in the acceleration phase hmm however in your traditional channels your margins are set then they don't vary on a on a daily basis or a monthly basis so mm. they are far more stable predictors of profitability mm. and your pnl management mm. now that said is d2c as a channel not viable no it is it should be because every brand should be available across pretty much every channel for the customer to buy mm. now for them to expand into different channels is where the pressure starts Hmm. Now I'm not talking about say the actual D2C businesses like Lens Cart and Licious they are pure bread D2C businesses. Hmm. I'm talking about the other FMCG businesses which primarily sell online without hmm. a physical distribution setup. Hmm. They are the businesses that are going to feel the pinch because if your brand is built on Amazon, Facebook and Google or your hmm. business is built there you and you haven't focused on building a brand one you're limited to that availability the reach that is available through these channels mm-hmm. and if you're a brand that is focused on just the people who are shopping here great you need to start building your brand mm. if not you're going to go down the drain very fast mm. and if you're focusing on these channels mm. you need to provide an experience for the consumer that goes across channels mm. your See, for most D two C brands that continue to see themselves as D two C brands, mm-hmm. I'm afraid the end is near mm. because they aren't reaching the the customers that they're supposed to, mm. and they need to deliver an omni-channel experience with omni-channel communication and omni-channel availability. That is the That, only way they're going to scale the business. This is something I think I read in one of the I think posts put up by Arindam Paul. who is the cbo for atomberg and he spoke about the differences in uh, uh, stages and marketing that hmm. possibly a brand needs to do when they are scaling up from okay. 0 to 10 arr uh, 10 to 100 arr 100 and plus arr and hmm. one of the things that i liked in the may, in the way he explained was that uh, when you are a small brand like you said you are in the startup phase Uh, you found your pmf after finding mm. your pmf you are still looking at early adopters mm. and a certain number of early adopters will deliver the kind of revenue that your company is ready for right but like you said sharan pretty soon if a business is going fast and you are doing good for yourself you are you will start running out of early adopters mm. they will prove to be inefficient or insufficient for the revenue requirement that you have beyond that you will have to go searching out of that domain and uh, just stressing on this a bit you will run out of early adopters you will not run out of reach the reach is still there right but the entire reach of digital does not mean that all of them are early adopters exactly 
so there are early adopters online there are early adopters offline yes now your initial level of marketing spending etc that you can afford with the kind of ROAs ROAs that you have set for yourself mm-hmm. will give you early adopters o- online mm. now to get to the next level of people online you are going to spend burn a lot of money that is exactly where a lot of the businesses lose money correct. going on chasing ROAs correct so then i think one needs to realize that when, when is that stage when your flywheel on amazon or flipkart has stopped giving you better returns mm. and that is the time when you need to also find some kind of method to build your brand offline and get early adopters from there also absolutely that's exactly what i'm trying to say so yeah. you can you can set up online but you will scale offline and mm-hmm. if you are an fmcg business your critical mass is there your your early adopters your early majority you need to chase by being present it's not either or it is about being available online offline and pretty much everywhere possible mm. and that is what proves to be difficult for a lot of the d2c brands i agree with you mm. but it might be important for us to dwell one dwell a bit on why do we think it is going to be difficult Hmm. See now that's actually a tricky question hmm. because is it is it is it the hard is it hard work absolutely hmm. is it impossible no and the analogy i would use here is that of healthy eating hmm okay it's it's completely a mindset issue hmm and it's true that everything you eat is either improving or deteriorating your health one way or the other hmm now if you're used to having fast food every day fast food and junk every day mm. and you suddenly have to move to say millets and ragi and all the health food without sugar and you're not you're not going to be able to do that mm. and you're going to even if you try to you will go after it say for a few days and then one cheat day will become a cheat week and become a cheat month and it'll take a and i've i've been through that cycle quite a few times myself so i understand mm. the mindset mm. and that's the same thing that happens to a lot of the d2c businesses mm. because they have tasted revenue acceleration by skipping the long chew now putting that money back into distribution requires patience because that is not going to give you rewards at the same pace, pace as what you've been used to mm it's going to take time to build the infrastructure and the distribution there's going to be hard negotiations with the distributors you want to train sales people you got to go to go visit retailers individually be it modern trade or traditional trade there's a lot of leg work required mm. now when you're used to getting say uh a thousand units of sale every day Hmm. and for the same 1000 units of sale you got to work for a week or two weeks setting up infrastructure you want a cheat meal you want to put that money even if if it comes at the cost of your health which means equivalent to the profitability hmm. even if you will get low profit or sometimes no profit but you will still get the revenue your mind is tuned to chase after the revenue hmm and people who can break through this are the ones who make brilliant case studies hmm and very very few manage to do that because if you've tasted accelerated growth before doing the infrastructure for it building the infrastructure for it hmm. your mind doesn't reset hmm. for you to accept the slow acceleration that's going to come with the infrastructure building at least hmm. slow to start with it's obviously going to give you in- incredible scale over time Mm. that's the same as working out and eating healthy and living a very happy healthy life mm. you know what the answers are but your mind refuses to budge correct okay yeah yeah so therefore you are saying that uh, you need a certain kind of mentality and perseverance to be able to go after such opportunities uh, to do that hard work which is equivalent of the long chew absolutely mm. it might not be as long as as it could have been for you otherwise hmm. but the mind doesn't know how long it's going to take hmm. 
and therefore the mind refuses to oblige. Thank you for listening to Cobb, conversations on the business of brands with Sudeep Chavla and Sharvana Raghavan. Subscribe and learn more at cobcast.net. That's C O B B C A S T dot net. Uh, there is some hard work that will need to be put in, but more importantly, you will need to be ready to put in that hard work without necessarily uh, immediate returns coming your way. Yeah, right. but that will set you up for the uh, sustainable growth, profitable growth later on. Absolutely. Okay. Fair. What after that? So what after that? Now, if you manage to do that, hmm. then you go back into the FMCG evolution. Hmm. You go hmm. back into the acceleration phase, but this time with a lot better health of business, and you're primed for growth. And then you go through the full ev- evolutionary cycle. And if you've done the hard yards, then you can go through it pretty fast. Hmm. But if not, there is a very very imminent fork in the path. Okay, what is that? So the advantages that the D2C brands had was was basically two. One was the liquidity that they had from the investors. Mhm. And two was that the niche segments at least until recently were seen by the larger FMCG businesses as too small to address at scale. So a lot of the micro niches were let alone by the large businesses. So they were basically vacant spots. Hmm. But that's changing now. So larger companies are either acquiring this first mover brands like ITC by Yoga Bar, Soulful by Tata's, hmm. Beardo by Marico. So a lot of these businesses have been acquired and they've invested, I mean, or they've invested heavily in startups using the startups to fill the gaps and with the might of the infrastructure that they have. Hmm. So they invest in these startups leverage their strengths of leverage of using the e-commerce and the digital channels mm-hmm. and then back it up with the distribution might that they already have yeah so okay that's what the large companies are doing now mm-hmm. and if you manage to get it you manage to sell to one of these large companies because you've demonstrated great business health fantastic that's what you get at the end of rainbow right mm-hmm. people say mm-hmm. you get either pots of gold or leprechauns at the end of a rainbow mm, mm. now selling out at a good valuation to a larger fmcg company is the pot of gold but that's difficult to get mm, mm. but the others have a very tough decision to make mm. either you roll up your sleeves and get down to building your infrastructure mm-hmm. or you bite the bullet and mm-hmm. you sell it at bottom of the barrel valuation you have to exit the business Hmm. because if you're not making money already mm-hmm. and with the rate at which the large companies are building their digital infrastructure and with uh, the dreaded word today of ai coming in it's accelerating this adoption the advantage that the d2c startups had is fast vanishing hmm. so it you either sell at good valuation or build your infrastructure so that you build up great valuation hmm. or you exit the business this is what's okay. going to happen okay another argument sharan that i found was a number of the dcc businesses who have done very well for themselves hmm. are the ones who have rode rode some wave a bigger wave absolutely when flipkart was becoming big when amazon was becoming big when nike was becoming big a number of brands that were present on these platforms who were riding it became fairly big right. yeah one of the caveats therefore i would want to put to what you're saying right now is that uh, you know we none of us uh, are foretellers or fortune tellers but if there is another wave that you know dramatically changes the uh, number of ad- uh, early adopters on uh, e-commerce yeah and creates a significant amount of reach differential uh, mm-hmm. then who knows Uh, the runway for just being a d2c brand might become longer yeah it could yeah yeah um, 
and therefore you know you could delay your long queue stage your brand building stage a little bit mm-hmm. uh, but uh, you know at at one point in time you would feel the need to build your brand mm-hmm. and possibly build offline distribution now uh, sharan after mm-hmm. we have you know given this hypothesis to our listeners mm-hmm. i have the flip question for you okay yeah one is about big companies investing into startups or buying etc mm-hmm. uh, but you also see almost every fmcg worth their salt mm-hmm. uh, or any big company worth their salt getting into d2c brands themselves <laughs> yes that's true <laughs> yeah now they have been through the long queue they already have the moat now what's what what do you think they are thinking is when they are going this way see there are uh, i'd say there are two kinds of people who do this mm-hmm. or the two kinds of d2c brands from established fmcg businesses that i've seen mm. one is primarily because they had fomo the entire world was talking about d2c brands d2c brands taking over the world mm. and suddenly without too much thought a lot of the fmcg businesses ended up launching their own d2c brand mm. now it beats me why when you have a uh, a reach of a certain amount a few lakh stores why would you not leverage that for a brand you're launching mm. it really didn't make too much sense and mm. see d2c as a channel must be optimized for all fmcg businesses Mm. but d2c as a strategy i think it's it's past its due date it's gone mm-hmm. d2c cannot be a strategy for building business in fmcg mm. now the other kind of fmcg businesses that i see launching brands is that they've adapted to this fail fast mechanism mm-hmm. now earlier when you do your consumer research for innovation and you test the product and you wait for your results to come in it's 18 to 24 months easily for the fmcg businesses to launch a new brand hmm now they are short circuiting that in innovation or uh, what do you say timeline by being fast to market even at the cost of business as, as a even by selling products at a loss because they are not optimizing for production yet they saying i've got a product i want to launch the brand seems to have resonance there seems to be a need i'm going to test it by day to see so you don't invest too much money you are still out sometimes even outsourcing the production for established fmcg companies you have a vague timeline saying if i hit a certain critical volume my pnl will start making sense but right now i know i'm selling it at a loss because i want to test my price point i want to test if the product is working i want to test if my proposition is working is my innovation worth its salt Mm. now that is a reason why a lot of the large fmcg businesses are using d2c channel as a testing phase for the business mm mm okay fair now, now i want to go back to the other point you made mm. about riding a wave i know you're you are the you're the person the voice of hope on the podcast mm. <laughs> uncom but i i want to caution people who wait for that wave right mm, mm. because these waves as much as we can't predict them mm. we also cannot expect them mm-hmm. now if you see the businesses that did well during the wave that we saw the digital wave and the covid lockdown phase a mm. lot of businesses did well because of lack of options the consumer had mm. the lack of con- option the consumer had but very few of them translated into building brands hmm for example mama earth has built a strong brand for itself hmm. it started early rode the digital wave amplified it during the covid lockdown phase leveraged all all the goodwill they'd built all the infrastructure they'd built by then hmm. and now they're expanding into retail yeah now, i don't i can't think of too many brands that did businesses that we did well mm-hmm. that have strong brands despite the growth that they had mm, mm. so mm. it is while it is great to have the chance to ride a wave that can't be your strategy that's a strategy of hope if you're willing to ride the wave waiting for a wave mm. unless you can preempt a wave you got technological advantage that's a different case that's a zero to one philosophy where 
it's a one in a million chance. Yeah. I'm not talking about them at all. But yeah. for the regular FMCG businesses that are running today, hmm. be it healthy snacks or any kind of indulgent snack that's happening, hmm. waiting for a wave cannot be the answer. Yeah. No, no, of course. I, I didn't mean that you should plan or hope for a wave. Uh, but waves are actually freak phenomena that actually are not controlled by any of the players themselves. Exactly. They could possibly be a beneficiary or have somebody or could be or they could be somebody who is at the wrong end of it. You don't know which way the wave will turn. <laughs> uh, but everybody hopes that they'll be on the right side of the wave. Uh, but to ride the wave, you have to be in the waters. So, <laughs> and I think that's that's also one of the things that uh, you know larger FMCGs hope for. That while being in D two C space gives them uh, a little bit of PR, some kind of shareholder advantages, um, gives them a fail fast, uh, try fast, fail fast mechanism of uh, going about their innovation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And of course, gives them an omni-channel experience for some of their digital savvy consumers. Uh, and who knows, a wave might make it big someday. <laughs> Absolutely. Hope is always there. Hope is always there. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Okay, excellent. I think uh, uh, this is an interesting one. Honestly, I, I, I don't, uh, I don't uh, fear to admit that I'm a little out of depth uh, on this specific topic of D2C per se, uh, uh, whatever I say or whatever I absorb is just basis whatever I've read about this topic or heard some of the other people say on different podcasts. Uh, but this was, an, this was a question which was ranking, rankering in my mind for some time. And thank you for putting this together, Sharon. I think it at least solves my doubts. I'm hoping some of the listeners would uh, benefit from it as well. Uh, hopefully yeah yeah some of the core things i would possibly leave everybody behind uh, uh, you know from what i gathered uh, from your hypothesis or your supposition is that number one uh, the six stages to brand building within fmcg are stages which any business would have to go through one way or the other one way or the other you can't skip a stage right what you can do however rush through some of them if you meet the objectives which that stage is meant for. So the stage is not determined by the time spent in it. Stage is just a milestone that you are supposed to reach before you get to the next flywheel of your brand or your business. Right. 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 So therefore, there is a hope for all kind of brands, regardless of whether you are B2C or not, that if you reach that milestone sooner, great, good for you, move to the next stage. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the first thing. Then number two, we spoke about the fact that, uh, you know, D2C, uh, all the, you know, from, from a thinking point of view, all the D2C brands need to recognize the fact that when they're starting, e-commerce gives them a great way of reaching the first set of consumers, testing their PMF and, you know, uh, not getting bothered by the moat that is owned by traditional businesses. And once you've reached a certain stage, you will therefore then look at uh, satisfying or serving omni-channel needs of your consumers. Right. Uh, what that does is it gives you dual advantage. Number one, it helps you create brands. And number two, it helps you improve your margin structure. And creation of brand, improvement of margin structure hopefully gets you into a flywheel so that you can keep, in, keep investing into your brand and it starts giving you significant returns. Yeah. What you also spoke about, Sharon, is that, uh, you know, the mentality is usually something that comes in the way of, uh, you know, a T2C brand becoming significantly bigger. Yeah. So if you are, you know, if you are stuck with this mentality of just being a D2C brand, you will therefore fit some kind of a glass ceiling. Right. And, you know, and that is where we see a lot of the D2C business businesses start losing money mm. and therefore then they are forced to sell to larger businesses uh, a number of times. Uh, though I'm, I must admit that a number of cases that you spoke about might not have reached that stage and they sold off for a very different reason. Right. Uh, they, they, I, they are usually called the strategic acquisitions. 
strategic partnerships in fact partnerships yeah where the founders continue to stay engaged in the business despite being acquired correct and they might have found some kind of synergy with the acquiring company right uh, but the moot point that you were making was that uh, if you go in with the mentality of remaining a d2c brand then you will not be able to cross a certain barrier right yeah so therefore you need to get over that mentality get into therefore the long queue deliverables and then you know revitalize your business to achieve the next higher levels absolutely and once you break open that mentality once you've gone through that long queue it might not be very long for you but then you have joined the you know the balance omni channel fmcg businesses and you have given yourself an opportunity to really uh, become as big as some of these other businesses that have existed for some time now yeah wow and last but not the least we also spoke about the fork in the road from a larger fmcg point of view uh, the larger fmcgs uh, are also looking at this space are also participating in this space uh, from a point of view of number one trying to launch some products uh, see whether they work with the consumers they are also testing their pmf and this seems like a, a slightly easier and faster way of you know doing recursive thinking and testing on their products uh and you know you will therefore see many of them participating in this space and utilizing the advantages that e-commerce and modern trade etc offer to them yeah and therefore sharan can i ask you what is your final advice if i am a startup founder mm -hmm. what's your final advice to me one line advice at which stage are you at i am at the startup stage go through the rigmarole of building infrastructure build your brand to be omni channel expect to serve omni channel customers and you're fine do not define your brand by a channel it's you it needs to be far bigger than that excellent and in this uh, you know sharan has repeated and he did not say it in his exact words that d2c is not a strategy can't be a strategy so therefore if you think d2c is going to be your strategy then there is a problem D2C is a phase that all businesses have to go through, and you you outgrow that phase possibly sometime. Or the I'd later still call it a that. channel. You could continue to exist in the D2C channel. Yeah, just of that, course. That can't just define your business. Business, correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. I think those are some important points for many of our listeners to consider. Uh, should any of you choose to disagree? or have a different point of view <laughs> please feel free to write to us uh, on any of the channels uh, reach out to us on linkedin or you can uh, leave it in the comments and we'll be very happy to you know one receive your feedback and number two possibly do another episode where we could uh, either clarify or maybe build in your uh, points or your comments into a little more nuanced and a refined stance that we might have uh, we will also leave behind a form Uh, in the show notes in the comments and therefore you could use that form to one give your give us your reactions any uh, comments or suggestions that you have and give us a little bit of idea about yourself so that we could address your queries better in the next episode on that note thank you very much charan thank you sir thank you for listening to call Conversations on the business of brands with Sudeep Chavla and Sharvana Raghavan. Subscribe and learn more at copcast.net. That's C O B B C A S T .net.